Once again, I am so glad that you're joining me for this, our Tuesday Bible study, our continuous reading of the book of Genesis. This is the eighth Tuesday after the blessing of the Holy Spirit, the season of Pentecost. We continue with a story about Jacob. There's a great deal of information in the book of Genesis about Jacob and his story, how God took him from the heel grasper, the one who always wanted to take by force what he thought was owed to him. And from there, God took him and made him into the humble man who became the father of the entire nation. He became the eponymous ancestor called Israel. We're not at that point yet. He's still in the process of being transformed by God. So let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, bless our lesson today. Open up our hearts to your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's see, where have we left Jacob before? Jacob, if you remember, he was one of the twin boys born to Rebekah, his mother, and Isaac, his father. His father, Isaac, was a goodly, godly man. The Bible doesn't mention a lot about Isaac, except about his goodness. He is kind of the anti-Abraham and anti-his son, Jacob. He's a very peaceful man, a man of great love and depth and character. Jacob, on the other hand, Mr. Heel Grasper, remember that's what that name means, Heel Grasper, takes by force everything as though everything is owed to him. Well, he's finally learned his lesson. He stole from his older brother, his older brother's inheritance, his older brother's reputation and name and blessing. But as I mentioned last week, there was a consequence to that. When you take by force something you believe that you were owed, it creates broken relationships. He didn't trust God. Remember his father Isaac trusted God to provide for him. Abraham, it took him long enough, but he eventually got to the point near the end of his life, he said, you know what, God? Whatever is your will, I'm willing to do. Jacob isn't quite there yet. So because he's broken his relationship with his family, he's off in a distant country. He's now going to Uncle Laban. Laban was his mother's brother, Rebekah. It's her brother. So he runs away from home, and here he is in this distant country. He says, well, you know what? I hear my, my Uncle Laban, he's got a pretty good thing going out there. And I'm going to go and live with him, and maybe he'll provide a job for me. I'm family. You know, family takes care of you. The news, by the way, probably hadn't gotten to Laban yet about the dishonesty of, 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 of Jacob. But I'm not sure it would have mattered, because you're going to find out Laban could hold his own, let me tell you, against Jacob. So let's hear this lesson for today. By the way, this is like an epic, beginning of another epic love story. Remember how a couple of weeks ago we talked about Isaac and Rebekah and the epic love story that they had? This is even epicer. epic cur er, I don't know, epic -er. It's more epic than the story of Isaac and Rebekah. This is the love story, the beginning of Jacob and Rachel. As I mentioned to you, he's still on the run from Esau after deceiving him. The heel grasper, however, meets his match. Bam! Remember, this type of thing is not God's will. This is why the Bible tells us these stories. The Bible says, this is not God's will for us to live like this. God's intention is always for us to reconcile with one another. But even the people of God wrestle with sin and brokenness. He meets his match. The tables get turned. Wine will be spilled and tears will be shed by the time today's lesson is done. So let's hear what goes on. Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative. See, it seems like a good guy. Well, you wait. Because you're my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? So again, Jacob came and is serving his, his uncle. He says, oh, this is getting food on the table. Tell me what you want your wages to be. Laban had two daughters. The name of the older one was Leah. The name of the younger one was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak. What? She needed glasses? Was she blind? <laughs> no, that's an idiomatic Jewish phrase. You know, we have uh, the opposite of that phrase. Oh, she's easy on the eyes. Yeah, 
she's really hot, she's really cute, whatever the case might be. No, this case, Leah was weak. Her eyes were weak. It means that, man, this woman was ugly. Woo! Not something you want to take home to mama, or whatever the case might be. It's kind of a really sad commentary. Sometimes, unfortunately, we judge people by such superficial things. So she's, her eyes were weak. She's not pleasant to look at, okay? But Rachel, all the beauty went to her. Rachel was beautiful of form and face. Oh, that's an interesting Hebrew word. Now, when we think of that, we think of this face right here. But that concept was so much more than, it's not, it's, it's much deeper than skin deep. When they're talking about the face, they're talking about what's really inside of her, what radiated out of her. She was beautiful inside and outside, is how we might say that today. Now, Jacob loved Rachel. Huh, who wouldn't, right? So he said, I will serve you for seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, oh, it's better I give her to you than to give her to another man, so stay here with me. So Jacob served for seven years for Rachel. They seemed to him but a few days. Isn't that romantic? Seven years. It was just a few days. He was so excited to finally get married to the love of his life. Beautiful love story, right? <laughs> Wait. Wait for it. Jacob said to Laban, give me your wife, my time is completed, then I may go into her. Laban gathered all the men of the place and he made a feast and then it was the evening he took his daughter Leah and he brought her to him and Jacob went into her. What? How did he not know it was Leah? Well, you know, again, it's dark. They didn't have electricity. She uh, maybe had a veil over her head. Who knows? Didn't see her. So he went into her, they became husband and wife. Lepa also gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came about in the morning that, behold, it was Leah! You gotta be kidding me. He realized that he's been bamboozled. Well, no, you know, it's hard to feel sad for Jacob, isn't it? This guy was a disgusting man. I mean, he did some really terrible things in life. You're like, oh, you just got what was coming to you, buddy. Ha! Ah, deal with that. Well, he's incensed. He's righteously indignant. He goes to his, his uncle, who's now his father-in-law, and says, What is it you've done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why have you deceived me in this way? But Laban said, it's not the practice. Huh. See, Laban is a lawyer here, okay? Come on. It's like, you should have known better that this was going to happen to you. Listen to what he says. Laban says, it's not the practice in our place to marry off a younger daughter before the, uh, the, before, the, before the firstborn. So he goes on and makes another deal with him. So, complete the week with this one. In other words, fulfill your husbandly duties for the next week with Leah. And then here's what's going to happen. I'll give you the other also for the service, which you shall serve me for another seven years. So, as Jacob did so and completed her week with Leah, and then Laban gave to him his daughter, Rachel, as his wife. So, this man is, he's got two wives now, kind of crazy. The Bible, by the way, isn't condoning this type of marriage, multiple wives. But it was just a reality in that day. Understand that men had much shorter lifespans, and they needed to repopulate the species as much as possible in the tribe. So it probably was not that uncommon for men to take two or three wives in that day and age, because they needed everybody producing babies. All right? I don't mean to be gross about this, but that's why multiple marriages were common back then and why it doesn't make any sense ever today. It just doesn't make any sense. Jacob fell in love, as I mentioned to you. Wanted to marry his uncle's daughter, Rachel. As he said, it was not the custom to marry the younger daughter, but he was willing to do it. It seemed like a day in the service of this 
this girl. And it's just amazing. And then you saw the deception. Once again, it creates a rivalry. Once again, this story is a story about brokenness. But in this case, it's a brokenness that we are going to see develop between the two sisters who now have a rivalry for their husband. It's another way the Bible is saying, you know, this dual marriage thing, it's not a good idea. It's dumb. It creates a rivalry. God is not about rivalries. God is not about competition. God is not about somebody winning and somebody else losing. God wants all of us to win because he loves us so much. One of the things I think we learn from this story is that we need to remember that the brokenness of this world is almost entirely created by human activity. But here's what's also amazing about this story. Despite the pressures put on, on our characters, our actors, because of the disdain they had for each other, because of the competition they had for each other, the pressures because of the deception of Laban, the evil works that they did to each other, Guess what prevails in this story? Love prevails. Isn't that amazing? I'm here to give you some hope today. Because I tell you, there are a lot of hate-filled things going on today in our country, in our world. But I am here to tell you that love always prevails. Always prevails. And I know you don't believe it. You want to know why you don't believe it? Because you're listening to the evening news every single night. You're listening to talk radio or all these talk show hosts. All you hear every single day is how tragic and awful and horrible this world is, and your mind is getting filled with event after event. You go throughout the day, you see some terrible thing and how somebody treated somebody else, and all of a sudden your whole day is ruined. You say, I can't believe somebody treated me or treated that person that way. Your whole day is consumed by that one act of violence. But guess what you've just missed? Because you've got blinders on. You missed the fact that there were hundreds of beautiful stories being played out all around you. You don't remember any of them because you take the beautiful stories for granted. Stop taking the beautiful stories that take place every single day for granted. Stop looking at the horrible stories and making them like this. And all those many stories of great love and care that we have for another and minimizing them like this. This is why you are in such chaos in your life. Because you take the bad stories and make them like this, and the good stories which are like this, and make them like this. Yeah, there's some tragic things that happened here. But love prevails. God is still God. God, despite the tragedies of life and our broken condition, lifts us up and makes sure we know that love will always win. I want to share one thing, because I've seen so many depressed people recently. Their hearts are filled with such despair. They're just flabbergasted by how we treat each other. I want you to keep your eyes open for the good things for the flowers that grow up between the cracks in your sidewalk, the green grass that grows despite the pressures of urbanization that we put upon it. Life and love always wins and will always find a way. And it's always more prolific than evil. There are seven and a half billion people in this world Let's just say, for sake of ease and argument and math, not one of my strong suits, that each one of us human beings has 10 unique interactions with other people every single day. That's 75 billion personal, unique interactions that we humans have with one another every single day. How many of those 75 billion interactions end in tragedy? Very few. How many of them are actually interactions of love and kindness and helpfulness? Almost every 
single one of them. So you see what happens? You got your blinders on this. There's maybe several million tragic, horrible things that happen every day, and I'm not going to minimize those. There's another police officer shot, another officer who shoots somebody else, and we take those events as though it represents everything. But yet every single day, there's 75 billion human interactions that don't end in violence, that end with care and compassion and love. And yet you focus on that one and it destroys your entire day, your entire week, your entire month and determines for you who humans are. Oh, they're horrible, horrible, humans are horrible. Really? Love always wins, people. 75 billion interactions a day. I guarantee you at least 74 of them, 74 billion of them, are out of kindness and love and care and compassion. So you can allow this mount to determine how you view humanity and the world around you, or are you going to take your blinders off and see that God's love always wins. Let us pray. God, your love always wins. Always. I give up. I've tried enough to fight against it. I've tried hard enough to make chaos and woe. You always win. Yes, there are great tragedies played out every single day, but God, love always wins. You are always victorious. You are in control of this world. Despite our attempts to destroy it, you win. We give thanks. Take off our blinders, God. Let us see the great acts of love, your unfailing kindness and mercy for this world that takes place every single day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you in favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Go out from this place and see the love. Amen.